Okay, so today I want to talk to you about the possible relation between predictive coding and uh, brain oscillation. So first let me tell you about uh, brain oscillations, and in particular alpha oscillations. The uh, alpha rhythm is uh, possibly the only oscillation that you can see in a wake human EEG with the naked eye because it is so big. Uh, here's an example, one of the first EEG recordings made by uh, Hans Berger in 1929. But even though alpha is so big, it has been mainly ignored by neuroscientists for decades because it tends to show a negative relation with perception and cognition. It typically increases when the brain is idling, as in this recording, when the subjects stop performing the mental arithmetic task, or when they close their eyes, or when they don't pay attention to uh, a stimulus. In recent years, however, there's been converging experimental evidence suggesting that uh, the alpha rhythm could play an important functional role in perception and cognition. It looks like it could be involved as an active inhibitory process for irrelevant stimuli. It could serve as a temporal reference or a framing mechanism to parse sensory inputs. And in some cases, we can even note a positive relation between alpha amplitude and visual processing, just like in the case of impulse response functions that I want to describe now. So what's an impulse response function? It is uh, calculated by cross-correlating a brain signal, for example, uh, EEG, with a random stimulus, for example, a white noise luminance sequence. So if the brain signal is systematically modulated by the input stimulus, then this relation should be visible as a sig significant correlation with the particular temporal lag. So in practice, we record EEG from human subjects while they observe a random luminance sequence on a screen. So it looks a bit like this. The stimulus has no interesting spatial structure, just a lot of temporal fluctuations, and they're fully random. So when you cross-correlate this uh, random flickering stimulus with human EEG, what you see is a very strong 10 hertz oscillation in the uh, IRF. And mathematically, this means that the average EEG response to a unit increment of luminance on the screen can last up to lags of about one second. Yeah. And it also means that even though the stimulus contains all frequencies because it is white noise, the EEG will only and selectively respond in the alpha band around 10 hertz. So this is like a long-lasting reverberation of sensory information, and that's why we, we call this a perceptual echo. Now, what's remarkable about these perceptual echoes is that the neurons in the visual system have typical time constants of only 20, 30 milliseconds, and evoked brain responses only last about two, 300 milliseconds. So how can the visual system produce input-output relationships at lags of uh, up to one second? In other words, I'm asking about the, the functional, the computational mechanisms responsible for these perceptual echoes. And the possibility I want to discuss today is that these alpha oscillations could be a signature of predictive coding mechanisms in the brain. So first, let me remind you briefly about uh, predictive coding. In this framework, the higher level brain regions make hypotheses to explain activity in lower areas, and then using a generative model, they turn these, prediction, these hypotheses into predictions that are sent back to the lower areas. The lower areas compare the predictions with their inputs, and then the residual, the so-called prediction error, is sent back up the chain, and so on and so forth, until the system hopefully converges onto uh, a stable interpretation of the input. And of course, there doesn't have to be only one of these prediction error loops, uh, but similar loops can be stacked on top of another as a hierarchical system. Now, what does this have to do with alpha oscillations? Well, before showing you the model, let me give you the intuition behind it. When we compute these uh, impulse response functions, we do it with white noise stimuli, which are by definition unpredictable. And of course, that's very bad news for a predictive coding system, right? So in these random sequences, an input that would be stronger than average, just by chance, would cause a stronger than average prediction. But the prediction will be wrong because the stimulus is unpredictable. So this will produce a large error signal aiming to correct in the opposite direction, but the correction will also be wrong, producing an opposite error signal, and so on and so forth. And so you see that both the prediction and the error signals will oscillate out of phase. And because the whole process was triggered by something in the stimulus, then the IRF will also oscillate. So that's the intuition. 
Now let's see if the intuition is correct. So for this, we introduce a simplistic model of predictive coding, but that will be sufficient for our purposes. So in our model, we have two layers. Layer two constantly tries to predict the input, and layer one sends the residual so that the output, y of t, can move as close as possible to the input, right? So at this point, you might realize that the system that we just built is doing absolutely nothing. It's uh, just a very complicated way of uh, implementing the identity function where the input is directly copied as an output. But that's just a consequence of the type of stimuli we're trying to explain with this uh, model, right? In our uh, white noise sequences, there is no spatial structure, only temporal structure. And even that is uh, uh, fully random. In a real predictive coding model, of course, you would have a whole layer of input and a whole layer of output with a weight matrix U to represent a set of basis functions or receptive fields, and also a U transpose matrix to generate an estimate of the input, a bit like in an autoencoder. But if we get rid of the spatial structure in the stimulus, then we can actually collapse these layers uh, and replace the uh, weight matrix by the identity, and that's how we end up with this uh, simplified system. So in our model, uh, the input is a time-varying stimulus, for example, a white noise sequence. We call x of t the residual in uh, layer one, uh, which computes the uh, difference between the input and the prediction. And the prediction itself is y of t, which constantly attempts to match the input. So y is like an integrator neuron. The temporal derivative of y is x, the residual. And so you can see that whenever the prediction will be too low compared to the input, then the derivative will be positive and y will grow, whereas if y is too high compared to the input, the derivative will be negative and y will decrease, right? So uh, essentially the system is minimizing the distance between the input and the prediction. So it will be very good at tracking its input because x will only signal when the input changes and then y will quickly move towards the new input. So as you might expect, this first version of the system works very well. It can track any input, even random ones. Here the input is in blue and the prediction is uh, in red. But of course, that's just an idealized system. And what I want to tell you today is that if we take into account biological constraints, then we can end up with a system that behaves very differently. So for one, an integrator neuron in the brain cannot respond instantaneously, but it would have a membrane time constant, tau, on the order of about 20 milliseconds that would slow down its responses. So if I include tau in the equation, you see that the system can still track its inputs, but it ignores the fast fluctuations uh, and it acts as a sort of low-pass filter. Second, and perhaps most importantly, the different brain regions do not exchange information instantaneously, but it would take time on the order of 10, 15 milliseconds for the spikes to travel along the axons from one region to the next. So if we call this uh, communication delay delta t, we see that the residual x cannot really compare the input at time t with the prediction at time t, because the latest prediction available is only the one that was made at t minus delta t, because that's how long it took for information to come back from layer two to layer one. And similarly, the prediction cannot be updated based on the current residual, but only based on the residual made calculated at t minus delta t, because that's how long it took for information to go from layer one to layer two. And so if I now inject this parameter delta t in the model, you see that the prediction isn't tracking the input anymore, but it just oscillates with a period of about 100 milliseconds. And if I now look at the cross-correlation between input and prediction, lo and behold, you see that it oscillates at 10 hertz, just like our EEG impulse response functions. So if you followed me up to here, then you basically get the, the whole idea that I was trying to push today. Just to drive the point home, what we can do is uh, a systematic exploration of parameter space just to see if the previous result was just a fluke or a reliable behavior. So here are the actual equations that were implemented in the model. They are the same as the previous slide, except we also have um, a leak with a time constant uh, tau 2 that was fixed at 200 milliseconds just to make sure that the system goes back to baseline in the absence of inputs. Now, the important parameters in the model are tau, the membrane time constant, and delta t, the communication delay. 
So what we'll do is we'll vary these parameters systematically and we'll see how the system behaves. And we'll keep in mind that uh, in real brains, the uh, typical communication delay between areas would be about 10, 15 milliseconds, and time constants are more variable, but would stay roughly between 10 and 30 milliseconds. So this box here would be the biologically plausible region. Now what we'll do is, for each combination of parameters, we're going to present a lot of white noise sequences to the model, we'll record the predictions, and then we'll compute the impulse response function between input and output as before. And what we want to know is if this IRF oscillates, so we'll quantify the oscillation with an FFT, with a power spectrum, and we'll look at this power spectrum along two dimensions. We'll plot uh, vivid colors when the IRF oscillations is strong and dark or black otherwise, and the color itself will represent the frequency of the oscillation, and we'll color red everything right around 10 hertz in, in the alpha band. And so that's the pattern of results that we see. So you see that there's a lot of uh, parameter combinations that generate IRF oscillations, and uh, quite a good number of these would be in the uh, alpha band, and that's even more true for the biologically plausible region here. You see that basically any time that the IRF oscillates, it will oscillate right around 10 hertz. And this guy here that I showed before was a, a typical, typical case with uh, uh, delta T at 12 millisecond and tau at 17 millisecond. Okay, so in conclusion, did we demonstrate that alpha oscillations are caused by predictive coding? Absolutely not. We don't even know for sure that predictive coding actually happens in the brain, right? But what we can say safely is that if predictive coding occurs in a real biological brain with time constants, communication delays, then it will produce alpha oscillations. These oscillations will be most visible in situations where the predictive coding fails, because that's when you'll see this endless loop of prediction, correction, prediction, etc. But it's quite possible that in a general case for everyday vision with normal predictable stimuli, you wouldn't see too much of these reverberations. Nonetheless, this gives us an idea for the functional relevance of the uh, alpha rhythm. Maybe whenever you see an alpha oscillation in an EEG or MEG experiment, you might be looking at the signature of uh, predictive coding. And finally, I think it will be challenging but important to explore these oscillations in more full-blown standard uh, predictive coding models with uh, natural predictable inputs, uh, spatial structure, uh, receptive fields, retinotopic organizations, etc. And so that's what we'll do next. In the meantime, thanks. So we can take one quick question. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, you. So um, in your model, you are uh, introducing them with five instances of single cells to adopt it in response to the signal that you refer to GG, which is a massive one. Like So the delay between the neural activity. Oh, sorry. Uh, so if I understand the question correctly, then uh, the uh, the question would be that the time constant refers to individual neurons, but the EEG doesn't have a time constant. It's an instantaneous signal. So the EEG instantaneously picks up the neural activity, but it's still the neural activity that generates the, uh, the EEG, right? And here I'm modeling the neural activity, and I'm directly reading out the neural activity as if it was EEG. So I think I agree with you. Yeah, so the thing is the population is that it has to be more balanced. So when we have all this instantaneous response, maybe... No, so the idea would be that all the guys that care about the stimulus are doing this, because there's no spatial structure. So all they can do is follow this random temporal structure, and so they're all doing this together, right? If you have spatial structure, Things would be different. Yeah. All right. So let's thank our speakers again. Thank you.